Colonel L.B. was aide-de-camp to General L., Governor of St. Cloud. The general was a widower, in fact, that might excuse the intimacy of his only daughter with the L.B. family, which astonished me greatly. One day when I was dining at the colonel's with his wife, his stepdaughter, Ed, Mademoiselle L., the general sent for his aide-de-camp, and I remained alone with these ladies, who strongly entreated me to accompany them to the house of Mademoiselle Lenormand. If I had refused... I should have been in their bad graces. We took a carriage and went to the Rue de Tournon. Mademoiselle L.B. went first into the cave of the Sibyl, remained there a long time, but was very discreet about what was said to her. As for Madame Moiselle Lel, she told us very ingenuously that she had good news, that she would soon marry whom she loved, which in fact soon happened. These damsels urged me to consult the prophetess in my turn, and I soon perceived that I was known. For Mademoiselle Lenormand at once saw in my hand that I had the happiness to approach a great man and to be liked by him. Then she added a good deal more bosh of the same sort, which I got rid of, with thanks as soon as possible. So much did it bore me. Chapter 12. While the emperor was giving crowns to his brothers and sisters, the throne of Holland to Louis, Naples to Joseph, the Duchy of Berg to Prince Murat, Luca and Massacrera, to the Princess Lisa Guastella, to the Princess Pauline Borghese. While by means of family alliances and treaties, he was assuring the cooperation of the different states which had entered the Confederation of the Rhine. War broke out anew between France and Prussia. It does not belong to me to seek for the causes of this war, nor the quarter from whence the first provo provocations came. All I know about it is that I have heard the Emperor a hundred times, both at the Tuileries and on the campaign, while talking with his intimates, accused the old Duke of Brunswick, whose name has been so odious in France since 1792, and the young and beautiful Queen of Prussia of having excited King Frederick William to break the Treaty of Peace. According to the Emperor, the Queen was more disposed to make war than General Blucher himself. She wore the uniform of a regiment to which she had given her name, showed herself at all the reviews, and commanded the maneuvers. We left Paris at the end of September. It is not my intention to enter into the details of this marvelous campaign in which the emperor in a few days was seen to crush an army of 150,000 men, perfectly disciplined, full of enthusiasm and courage, and with their country to defend. In one of the first battles, the young Prince Louis of Prussia, brother of the king, was killed at the head of his troops by Guinday, quartermaster of the 10th Hussars. The prince was fighting hand to hand with his brave non-commissioned officer who said to him, Surrender, Colonel, or you are a dead man. Prince Louis replied only by a thrust of the saber, and Guinde plunged his own into his body. In this campaign, the roads being broken up by the continual passage of artillery, my carriage was upset, and one of the emperor's hats fell out of the window. A regiment which was going over the same road recognized the hat, by its particular form, and my carriage was righted on the spot. No, said these good fellows, we will not leave the first valet de chambre of the little corporal in a scrape. The hat, after having passed through all hands, was finally given back to me before my departure. On arriving on the plateau of Vimor, the emperor put his army in battle array and bivouacked in the middle of his guard. Toward two o'clock in the morning, he rose and set off on foot to examine the works on a road he was having dug in the rock for the transportation of artillery. He stayed more than an hour at the pioneers and before turning towards his bivouac, he wished to have a look at the nearest outposts. This excursion, which the emperor determined to make alone and without any escort, was very near costing him his life. The night was very dark and the camp sentries could not see ten paces around them. The first of them hearing some, one advancing into the gloom, and approaching our line, shouted, Who goes there? And made ready to fire. The emperor who, after he afterwards said, was so profoundly plunged in thought that he did not hear the voice of the sentry, made no response, and it was a ball whistling at his ear which drew him out of his abstraction. He saw at once the danger he was in and threw himself flat on his face. It was a wise precaution, for hardly had His Majesty let himself fall into this position 
Then the other balls passed above his head. And this church of the first century having been repeated by the whole line. This first firing having stopped, the emperor rose, walked towards the nearest post, and made himself known. His majesty was still at this post when the soldier who had fired on him came in, having just been relieved of guard. It was a young grenadier of the line. The emperor ordered him to approach, and pinching his cheek very hard, said to him, How is this, you rascal? You must have taken me for oppression. This rogue. Don't propose to waste his powder and shot. He fires at nothing but emperors. The poor soldier was greatly disturbed by the idea that he might have killed the little corporal, whom he adored like all the rest of the army, and he was hardly able to say, Pardon, sire, but it was the orders. If you did not answer, it is not my fault. They ought to have put it in the orders that you would not answer. The emperor smilingly reassured him, saying as he went away from the post, My good fellow, I'm not reproaching you. It was well enough aimed for a shot in the dark, but it will soon be daylight. Fire straighter and take care of yourself. The results of the Battle of Vienna fought October 14 are well known. Nearly all the Prussian generals, at least the best of them, were either taken or disabled from continuing the campaign. The king and queen took flight and did not stop until they reached Konigsberg. A few moments before the attack, the Queen of Prussia, mounted on a light and fiery horse, had appeared in the middle of the soldiers, and the elite of the youth of Berlin followed the royal Amazon, who galloped in front of the first lines of battle. You can see the flags she had embroidered herself in order to encourage her troops, as well as those of Frederick the Great, all blackened by cannon smoke, bending at her approach. And here the enthusiastic shouts that rose from all the ranks of the Prussian army. The sky was so clear and the two armies so close together that the French could easily distinguish the costume of the queen. This singular dress was the chief cause of the dangers she occurred in her flight. On her head was a helmet of polished steel, shaded by a superb plume. She wore a cuirass all glittering with gold and silver. A tunic of cloth of silver completed her attire and fell to the top of her bruticans, which were red with gold spurs. This costume enhanced the charms of the beautiful queen. When the Prussian army was routed, the queen stayed behind with four or five young men in Berlin who defended her until two hussars, who had galloped themselves with glory during the battle, galloped at full speed with uplifted sabers into the midst of this little group, which instantly dispersed. Seared by this unexpected attack, her majesty's horse ran away as fast as it could, and lucky it was for the queen that it was nimble as a deer, for otherwise the hussars would infallibly have captured her. More than once they were so close at her heels that she could hear Kev's speeches and jests of a sort to horrify her ears. Thus pursued, the queen had arrived in sight of the gates of Weimar, when a detachment of Klein dragoons were seen coming up at a full gallop. The leader had orders to take the queen at all hazards, but hardly had she entered the city when its gates were shut. The hussars and the detachment of dragoons returned disappointed to the field of battle. The details of this singular pursuit soon came to the ears of the emperor, who summoned the hussars to his presence. After expressing in very sharp terms his dissatisfaction with the indecent pleasantries they had dared to make at the queen's expense, at a time when her misfortunes demanded even more than the respect due to her rank and sex, the emperor inquired how these brave fellows had behaved during the battle. Learning that they had performed prodigies of valor, his majesty gave them the cross and a gratuity of 300 francs apiece. His majesty showed clemency to the Duke of Weimar, who had commanded a Prussian division. The day after the Battle of Vienna, his majesty, having gone to Weimar, lodged at the ducal palace where he was received by the duchess regent madame the emperor said to her i am pleased that you should have waited for me and it is because you have had this confidence in me that i pardon your husband when we were at the army i slept under the emperor's tent sometimes on a small carpet and sometimes 
on a bearskin which he used to wrap around him in the carriage. When it happened that I could not make use of these objects, I tried to procure a little straw. I remember that I did a great service to the King of Naples one evening by dividing with him a bundle of straw that was to have served for my bed. Here are some details which may give the reader an idea of the manner in which I passed the nights in campaign. The emperor would be reposing on his little iron bedstead, and I lying where... And how I could, scarcely would I fall asleep when the emperor would call me, Consta, sire, see who's on duty. Um, tell him to come and speak to me. I would leave the tent to notify the officer whom I would bring back with me. On his entry, the emperor would say to him, Go to such a court, commanded by such a marshal. Order him to send such a regiment to such a position. Assure yourself. Of that of the enemy, and then come and report to me. The aide de camp would go out and mount a horse to go and execute his mission. I would lie down again, and the emperor would seem to wish to sleep. But at the end of several minutes, I would hear him calling, Costa, sire, have the prince of Nushita summoned. I send word to the prince who presently arrives, and while they are conversing, I remain at the door of the tent. The prince would write some orders and withdraw. Such disturbances would take place several times during the night. Toward morning, his majesty would go to sleep, and then I, too, would have some moments for slumber. When aides de camp came to bring tidings to the emperor, I would waken him by a little gentle push. What is it? His Majesty would say, starting up at once. What time is it? Tell him to come in. The aide would make his report if it was necessary. His Majesty would rise directly and go out of the tent. His toilet did not take long. If there was to be a battle, the Emperor would look at the sky and the horizon. And I have often heard him say, There's a fine day brewing. Breakfast was prepared and served in five minutes, and in a quarter of an hour the table was cleared. The Prince of Neuchatel breakfasted and dined with His Majesty every day, and the longest repast was over in eight or ten minutes. And the Emperor would say, To horse! and ride off, accompanied by the Prince of Neuchatel, and aide the camper too, and a stamp, who always carried a silver flask full of brandy, of which the Emperor hardly ever made use. His Majesty went from one court to another, speaking to the officers and soldiers, interrogating them, and seeing with his own eyes all that it was possible to see. If there was an action of any sort, dinner was forgotten, and the Emperor did not eat until he came back. If the engagement lasted too long, then someone would take him without his asking for it. A little crust of bread and a small quantity of wine. Monsieur Collin, controller of provisions, has many time faced the cannon to carry this sight repast to the emperor. When a combat was over, his majesty never failed to visit the field of battle. He had assistance given to the wounded and encouraged them by his words. He sometimes re-entered overcome by fatigue. Then he would take a light repast and lie down to commence anew his interruptions of slumber. It must be remarked that whenever unforeseen circumstances forced the aides de camp to have the emperor awaken, he was always as ready for work as in the middle of the day. His awakening was as amiable as his air was gracious. The report of an aide de camp being ended, Napoleon went to sleep again as easily as if his nap had not been interrupted. During the three or four days that preceded in action, the emperor would spend the greater part of his time stretched above large maps, which he pricked with pins, the heads of which were made of wax of different colors. I have already said all who were in the emperor's service vied with each other in finding the surest and readiest means of providing whatever he might need. Everywhere on a journey, as in campaign, his table, his coffee, his bed, and even his bath could be prepared in five minutes. How often were we not obliged to remove in still less time the dead bodies of men and of horses in order just to put up his majesty's tent? 
I do not know in what campaign beyond the Rhine it was that we found ourselves obliged to halt in a wretched village where to make a lodging for the emperor. We were forced to take a peasant's hut, which had been used for a hospital. We had to begin by carrying out the amputated limbs and washing off the blood stains. This task was accomplished in less than half an hour, and all looked pretty well. The emperor sometimes slept for 15 minutes to half an hour on the battlefield when he was fatigued or if he wanted to await more patiently the result of the orders he'd given we were on the road to potsdam when we were overtaken by a violent storm it was so heavy and the rain fell so abundantly that we were obliged to stop and take shelter in a house near the road when buttoned up in his great great coat and not supposing that he could be recognized the emperor was surprised on entering the house to see a young woman whom his presence caused to tremble it was an egyptian who had preserved that religious veneration for my master which was felt for him by the arabs she was the widow of an officer of the army of egypt and chance had led him in saxony into the same house where she had been received the emperor granted her a pension of 1200 francs and charged himself with the education of his son the only inheritance which her husband had left her this is the first time said napoleon that i ever alighted to escape a storm i had a presentiment of the good deed that was awaiting me there the victory of vienna had stricken the prussians with terror the court had fled with such haste that everything in the royal residences had been left behind on arriving at potsdam the emperor found there the sword of frederick the great his gorget the broad ribbon of his orders and an alarm clock he had them taken to paris to be preserved in the hotel des invalides i prefer these trophies said his majesty to all the treasures of the king of prussia i will send them to my old soldiers of the hanover campaigns they will guard them as a testimony of the victories of the grand army and of the vengeance it has taken for the disaster of rosbach on the same day the emperor ordered the column raised by frederick the great to perpetuate the memory of the defeat of the french at rosbach to be taken to his own capital he might have contented himself with changing its inscription napoleon lived at charlottenburg where he had established his headquarters regiments of the guard were arriving from all sides all as soon as they were assembled orders were given to put on full uniform which they did in the little wood hut of the city the emperor made his entry into the capital of prussia between 10 and 11 o'clock in the morning he was surrounded by his aides de camp and his officers of the staff all the regiments marched past in the greatest order with drums in hands and bands at the head the excellent bearing of the troops excited the admiration of the prussians having entered berlin in the emperor's train we came to the square in the middle of which a bust of frederick the great had been set up the name of this monarch is so popular in berlin and throughout prussia that i have seen a hundred times when anyone happened to mention it whether in a cafe or any other public space all who were present rise take off their hats and give every sign of respect and even profound worship on arriving in front of the bust the emperor described a semicircle at a gallop followed by his staff and lowering the point of his sword he at the same time removed his hat and was the first to salute the image of frederick the second his staff imitated his example and all the general officers and officers who composed it ranged themselves in a semicircle around the bust with the emperor in the center his majesty gave orders that each regiment should present arms while marching in front of the bust this maneuver was not to the taste of some grumblers of the first regiment of the guard who with scorched mustaches and faces still blackened with the powder of yetta would have much preferred a billet on the citizens to the parade hence they did not conceal their ill humor and there was one of them who unpassing the bust in front of the emperor set between his teeth and without changing a muscle of his face and yet loud enough to be heard by his majesty that he didn't care a rap for this cursed beast his majesty turned a deaf ear but in the evening he repeated with a laugh the saying of the old soldier 
His Majesty elated at the shed so where his lodging had been prepared and where the officers of his household had preceded him, having learned that the electoral princess of Hesse Castle, sister of the king, was lying ill there in consequence of a confinement. The emperor went up to the apartment of this princess and after a rather long visit, he gave orders that this lady should be treated with all the respect due to her rank and her cruel position. Chapter 13. At Berlin, each day and each hour of the day brought the emperor news of some victory gained, some success obtained by his generals. General Beaumont presented him with 80 flags taken from the enemy by his division. Colonel Girard brought him 60 more taken from Blücher at the Battle of Wismar. Magdeburg had capitulated and a garrison of 16,000 men had laid down their arms before General Savarate. Marshal Mortier was occupying Hanover in the name of France. Prince Murat was entering Warsaw after chasing the Russians out of it. It was against the latter that the war was about to recommence, or rather continue, for the armies of Prussia might well be regarded as annihilated. The emperor left Berlin to conduct his operations against the Russians in person. We traveled in the little calashes of the country, as in all our journeys, the carriage of the Grand Marshal preceded that of the Emperor. The season and the passage of the artillery had made the roads frightful, and yet we went very fast. Besides Kutov and Warsaw, the carriage of the Grand Marshal was upset and his collarbone broken. The Emperor came up soon after this unlucky accident and personally supervised the Marshal's removal to the nearest post house. We always had a small medicine chest with us so that the indispensable requirements were promptly attended to. His Majesty remitted him to the care of his own surgeon and did not leave him until he had seen the first bandages applied. At Warsaw, where His Majesty spent the entire month of January 1807, he inhabited the Green Palace. The Polish nobility, eager to pay court to him, gave magnificent fetes and very brilliant balls at all the wealthiest and most distinguished people in the city were present. At one of these reunions, the emperor remarked, a young Polish lady, Madame V, 22 years of age and recently married to an old noble of a severe temper and very austere manners, who was fonder of his titles than of his wife. Still, he loved her much, but in return was respected rather than loved. The emperor was attracted to this lady at the first glance. She was fair, with blue eyes and dazzling white complexion. She was not tall, but she was perfectly well made and had a charming figure. The emperor approached and began a conversation in which she took her part with much grace and spirit and in a way that showed she had received a brilliant education. A trace of melancholy that pervaded her whole person rendered her still more attractive. His majesty fancied he saw in her a woman who had been sacrificed, whose family life was unhappy, and the interest inspired by this idea made him more enamored, more in passion, than he had ever been for any woman. She must have perceived it. The day after the ball, the emperor seemed to me in an unusual state of agitation. He would rise, walk about, sit down, and rise again. I thought I should never finish dressing him that day. Directly after his breakfast, he commissioned a great personage, whom I will not name, to go on his behalf to pay a visit to Madame V. And acquaint her with his sentiments and wishes. She haughtily refused his propositions, which were perhaps too brusque, or which the coquetry natural to all women might have counseled her to reject. The hero himself had pleased her. The idea of a lover resplendent with power and glory doubtless greatly disturbed her mind, but never had she thought of yielding in this fashion without a struggle. The great personage returned in great confusion and much astonished at not having succeeded in his negotiation. The next day at the levee of the emperor, I found him so preoccupied. He did not say a word to me, although he usually did so. He had written several times to Madame V the day before and she had not answered him. His self-love was extremely piqued by a resistance to which he was unaccustomed. At last, he wrote so many and such touching letters that Madame V yielded. She consulted to come and see the emperor between 10 and 11 o'clock in the evening. 
the great personage of whom I have already spoken received orders to go with the carriage to meet her at a designated place. While awaiting her, the emperor strode restlessly up and down, displaying as much emotion as impatience. Every minute he was asking me the time Madame V at last arrived, but in what a condition, pale, mute, and with eyes bathed in tears. As soon as she appeared, she was brought into the emperor's chamber. She could hardly stand and leaned, trembling on my arm. When I had introduced her, I withdrew along with the personage who had brought her. During her tete-a-tete -tete with the emperor, Madame V wept and sobbed that, in spite of the distance, I could hear her moaning in a way that rent my heart. It is probable that in this first interview the emperor obtained nothing from her. His Majesty summoned me about two o'clock in the evening. I made haste and saw Madame V coming out with her handkerchief over her eyes and still shedding bitter tears. She was taken back to her own home by the same personage. I thought she would never return. Two or three years later, nevertheless, as nearly... No, two or three days later, nevertheless, at nearly the same hour, Madame V returned to the palace. She appeared more tranquil. The keenest emotion was still depicted in her enchanting face, but her eyes at least were dry and her cheeks less pale. She went away at a rather early hour in the morning and continued her visits until the moment of the emperor's departure. Two months later, the emperor wrote to Madame V from his headquarters at Finkenstein, and she hastened to rejoin him. His majesty had an apartment prepared for her, which communicated with his own. Madame V installed herself there and no longer quitted the palace of Finkenstein. Leaving at Warsaw, her old husband, who, wounded in his honor and his affections, would never again see his wife, who had abandoned him. Madame V lived three weeks with the emperor until his departure and afterwards returned to her own family. During all this time, she never ceased to testify the tenderest as well as the most disinterested affection for his majesty. The emperor, for his part, seemed to comprehend perfectly all that was interesting in this angelic woman, whose gentle and self-sacrificing character has left an ineffaceable souvenir in my memory. They took all their meals together. I alone waited on them. Hence, I was in a position to enjoy their conversation, which, on the emperor's part, was always amiable, ardent, and eager, and on hers, always tender, impassioned, and melancholy. When His Majesty was not with her, Madame V spent her time either in reading or in watching through the Emperor's window blinds the parades and evolutions he caused to be executed in the court of the Chateau, and which he frequently commanded in person. Her manner of life, like her disposition, was always uniform. Her character delighted the Emperor and made him daily cherish her more tenderly. After the Battle of Wagram in 1809, the emperor went to live in the palace of Schoenbrunn. He had Madame V come there also. He hired and furnished a charming house for her in one of the Faubourgs of Vienna, not far from Schoenbrunn. I went mysteriously to fetch her every morning in a closed carriage without armorial bearings and with a single unliveried servant. I brought her into the palace also by a private door and introduced her into the emperor's apartment. The road, though short, was not free from danger, especially when it rained, on account of the ruts and holes one encountered at every step. Hence the emperor would say to me nearly every day, take care this evening, Constant. It has been raining and the road must be bad. Are you sure of your drivers, the carriage in good condition? And other questions of the same sort, all of which proved a sincere and real attachment for Madame V. For that matter, the emperor had reason enough for urging me to be careful for one evening. After we'd started from our house a little later than usual, the coachman upset us. In trying to avoid a rut, he'd thrown the carriage over the side of the road. I was on the right side of Madame V. The carriage fell to the right so that I was the only sufferer from the fall, while Madame V, tumbling on top of me, received no injury. I was satisfied to have saved her. I told her so, and she displayed her gratitude with a grace peculiarly her own. The hurt I felt at first was soon over. I was the first to laugh at it, and then Madame V, who described our accident to the, to his majesty as soon as we arrived. It was at Schoenbrunn that Madame V became pregnant. I shall not attempt to recall all the cares and attentions with which the emperor surrounded her. He made her come to Paris, accompanied by her brother, a very distinguished officer, and a waiting woman. He commissioned the guard marshal to buy a fine house for her in the Chaussée d'Antin. Madame V was happy. She often said to me, all my thoughts, all my inspirations come from him and return to him. He is all my good, my future, my life. 
Hence, she never left her house except when she came to the little apartments in the Tuileries. When this happens, this happiness was not permitted to her. She never sought diversions at the theater, the promenade, or in society. She remained at home, seeing very few persons and writing to the emperor every day. She was delivered of a son who bore a striking resemblance to his majesty. This was a great joy for the emperor. Hastening to her as soon as it was possible for him to get away from the chateau, he took the child in his arms and embracing it, as he had just embraced the mother, he said to him, I will make thee a count. Later we shall see the son receiving a final mark of attachment from the emperor at Fontainebleau. Madame V brought up her son at home and never quitted him. She often fetched him to the chateau where I admitted her by the dark stairway. When either of them was ill, the emperor sent Mr. Corvisar to them. This skillful physician once had the good fortune to save the young count from a dangerous malady. Madame V had a gold ring made for the emperor around which she rolled some of her beautiful fair hair. On the inside, this inscription was engraved, When thou shalt cease to love me, forget not that I love thee. The emperor never called her anything but Marie. Perhaps I have given too much time to this liaison of the emperor, but Madame V was totally different from the other women from whom his majesty had obtained favors, and she deserved to be called La Valliere of the emperor, although he never was ungrateful to her as Louis the Fourteenth was to the only woman by whom he was beloved. Those who, like myself, have had the happiness of seeing and knowing her well must have retained a recollection of her which will make them understand why, in my view, there is so great a distance between Madame V, a tender and modest woman, bringing up in retirement the son she had given the emperor and the favorites of the conqueror of Austerlitz. Chapter 14. The Russians in the campaign were animated by the remembrance of the defeat of Austerlitz and the fear of losing Poland. Hence, the winter did not deter them, and they determined to advance to attack the emperor. The latter was not the man to allow himself to be forestalled. He raised his winter quarters and left Warsaw at the end of January. On February 8th, the two armies met at Eilau. And there was fought the bloody battle in which both sides displayed equal courage. 15,000 dead were left on the field of battle, as many French and Russians. The advantage, or rather the loss, was the same in both armies, and a Te Deum was chanted in St. Petersburg, as well as in Paris, instead of a Te Profundis, which would have been much more appropriate. On returning to his quarters, the emperor loudly complained of the non-execution of an order he had sent to Marshal Bernadotte whose corps had not fought that day. It seems certain, in fact, that the victory which remained undetermined between the emperor and General Benningson would have fallen to the former if an entirely fresh army corps had come up during the battle as his majesty had calculated. Unfortunately, the aide-de-camp who was bearing the emperor's orders to the prince of Ponte Corvo fell into the hands of a party of Cossacks. When this circumstance became known, to the emperor on the following day, his resentment was abated, but not his vexation. Our troops bivouacked on the field of battle, which the emperor visited three times, distributing succor to the wounded and causing the dead to be buried. Generals at Poole, Corbineau, and Borsier were fatally wounded at Eilau. I seem still to hear the brave at Poole saying to his majesty, just as he was galloping off to charge the enemy, Sire... I am going to show you my big heels. They will go into the enemy's squares as if they were made of butter. An hour later, he was dead. One of his regiments, while fighting in an interval of the Russian army, was shot down and cut to pieces by the Cossacks. Only 18 of them escaped. General Altpool, three times forced to recoil with his division, thrice rallied them to the charge. The third time he again rushed on the enemy, crying out in a loud voice, Cuirassiers, forward! In the name of God, forward, my brave Cuirassiers! But Grapeshot had mowed down too many of these heroes. Very few of them were in condition to follow their leader, who fell covered with wounds in the middle of a Russian square into which he had flung himself almost alone. It was also in this battle, I think, that General Ornay killed one of the enemy's general officers with his own hand. The emperor asked him whether he could not have taken him alive. Sire, replied the general, in his broad German accent. I strike only one blow. 
but I try to make it a good one. On the very morning of the battle, General Corbineau ate the camp to the emperor while at breakfast with the chief attendants owned to them that he was beset by the most gloomy presentiments. These gentlemen tried to divert his mind from this idea and turn into a joke. A few minutes later, General Corbineau received an order from His Majesty needing money and not finding any at Monsieur de Minival's quarters. He applied to me, and I advanced it from the Emperor's cash box. Several hours afterwards, I met Monsieur de Minival and told him about General Corbineau's request and the sum I had given him. I was still speaking to Monsieur de Minival when an officer galloping by shouted to us in passing the sad tidings of the general's death. I have never forgotten the impression this piece of news made upon me, and I still find it inexplicable that sort of inner misgiving which had come to warn the hero of his approaching death. Poland was counting on the emperor for the restoration of its independence. Hence, the Poles were full of hope and enthusiasm when they witnessed the arrival of the French army. This winter campaign, however, displeased our soldiers greatly. The cold, the destitution, the bad weather inspired them with an extreme aversion to this country. In a review at Warsaw, while the inhabitants were thronging around our troops, one of the soldiers began swearing energetically against the snow and mud, and consequently against Poland and the Poles. You are very wrong not to like our country, Mr. Soldier, said a young girl belonging to a very good burger family of the city. For we like the French very much. You are certainly very amiable, mademoiselle, replied the soldier. But if you wish to persuade me of the truth of what you are saying, you will give me comrade and you will give me good dinner. At this, the parents of the young Pole came forward and said, Come along then, gentlemen. We will drink together to your emperor's health. They did, in fact, take the two soldiers with them and gave them the best meal they had during the entire campaign. According to the soldiers' four words, constituted the groundwork of the Polish language, kleba, nima, some bread, there is none, vora, sera, some water. Someone has gone to get it one day while the emperor was passing through the column of infantry in the environs of Missignets where the troops had experienced great privations on account of the miry roads, which interfered with the arrival of provisions. A soldier cried out to him, Papa, Kleba, Nima, responded the emperor at once. The whole column roared with laughter, and no one else asked for anything. During the rather long stay, the emperor made a Finkenstein. He was visited by a Persian ambassador for whom pleasure, for whose pleasure he had held several grand reviews. In his turn, his majesty sent an embassy to the Shah, placing at the head of a general Gardan, who was said at that time to have a special reason for wishing to go to Persia. It was claimed that his parents, after residing for a long time at Tehran, had been obliged to leave that capital in consequence of a riot against the Europeans, and that before taking flight, they had buried a considerable treasure in a certain place, the map of which they took back with them to France. To finish with this story, I will add that I was told afterwards that General Gardin had found the place in disorder, being unable to recognized the sites or discovered the treasure, had returned from his embassy empty-handed.